Pisaba Church. Thank you for the music, ladies. It was beautiful. So fall is already here, and where I'm from, there's really no season changes, but it's really beautiful to see all the trees. And it's really amazing because where we live, we have um, trees that they are like round, and when you drive by, you see so many colors, pink, orange, yellow, green, yeah. And their brightness are different, and they look like lollipops. <laughs> yeah. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to our church, to and our church. We have a few announcements this morning. Um, just want to start saying that we, we have an elders meeting right after um, service. Um, plus, we have the passing of outreach bags later on today. At what time? Right after potluck. It's going to be a little cold, but we are filled with Holy Spirit, and we are on fire, so... Don't let that stop you. Um, we also later tonight, we have a bonfire. It's going to be at the Plymouth Church. It's going to be at 6 p.m. Um, rain or not, it's still going to happen. So it's not an excuse. So please come. Please bring your shares and please bring warm clothes. Um, the address is in the bulletin. Um, if you have any questions, please approach one of the elders or the pastor. Yeah, so my wife is correcting me and letting me know that even, even if it rains, we're still going to have an activity indoors. Yeah. Yeah, so please attend. Yeah, it's a pretty big church. So. Also, next Sabbath, um, November 1st, we're going to have a gym night. And it's going to happen right after AY. It's going to be at 6.30. We're gonna, there's going to be food, and we're going to play games. And let me tell you, church, this church is very competitive when it comes to games. <laughs> so I really encourage you to come and see uh, your sh fellow church members get very competitive. <laughs> it's actually really fun. Um, I have one more annou announcement. Do you see? Good morning and happy Sabbath. Good morning. Hey, by a show of hands, how many of you like to sing praises to our Lord? Can I see a show of hands? I have an opportunity for you. Um, we have begun our uh, choir practices. The choir is preparing to sing. Uh, we're practicing on Wednesday evening right after prayer meeting, right here in the sanctuary at 8 p.m. We had a nice turnout last week, but we would like to have more. So I'd like to encourage those of you who like to sing praises to the Lord to come and sing. It's, we'll, we'll make it easy on you. It's not challenging, but it's a lot of fun, and I invite you to come out and sing. So we have one more thing that is off script. And John, can you bring the pastor, please? <laughs> hey, pastor. <laughs> you come here. I'm going to ask the elders to come here and join me for a second. Oh. Do something off script. Okay. Don't plan for it. <laughs> So it's this month is Pastor Appreciation Month. That's right. And we have something for you. <laughs> <laughs> if uh, the wife, um, Mie and the children, if they can come up here as well. <laughs> I'll let Elder Scott lead. <clears throat> Most of us know uh, Pastor Choi and his wife and the two children. And uh, this being uh, Pastor Appreciation Mo Month, right in the, in, in the nick of time here at the very end of October, uh, we'd just like to uh, uh, show appreciation for our pastoral family. So we've, the elders have uh, passed a card around and asked uh, you to sign that. There may be another uh, opportunity uh, for you to do that and we also have so you have the card there uh, excellent and we have a little uh, uh, gift card to a local uh, vegetarian restaurant uh, where you can <laughs> go and enjoy uh, it's right here on Packard Road so we want to present that to you as well so so uh, do we appreciate our pastor Mm. Yeah, we'll see you all. 
So uh, we're going to uh, now just have a, a prayer of appreciation for Pastor Chad. Uh, let's just bow our heads and uh, we'll pray now. Dear Father in heaven, uh, we thank you for all the gifts of ministry. Uh, we thank you for Pastor Choi, for Mie, for these uh, lovely children uh, who are ministering to our congregation. Lord, we uh, pray that you would continue to uh, prosper uh, this family in ministry and that each one of us would uh, also continue to uh, discover our gifts in ministry and support uh, our pastor by joining uh, with them, lifting up their arms in ministry uh, by putting forth uh, our own unique efforts uh, to minister and to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ here in Ann Arbor and across the county of Washtenaw. So we just pray your continued uh, blessing upon this pastoral family. In Christ's name we pray, amen. How long ago was it? I know it's been a while you've been with us. Steve has been helping us out with the uh, sound uh, booth uh, with Kyle up there, and they're both kind of tag-teaming. And so we really appreciate, appreciate him. He has a burden to get involved and be in ministry in some way, shape, or form to be involved in serving our church from the get-go. So that's wonderful. But uh, Steve, uh, just remind the congregation um, how long you've been with us. About two and a half years, I think. Two and a half years. And, and I believe that when we met, why don't you come closer? <laughs> I don't bite. <laughs> so, okay. So um, I, I believe that when you first came here, you really liked this church. You said you liked the fact that there was young people here. You, you felt like this was a church that you felt like you could belong to. And sure enough, you have found your place among us, and we're so happy for that. But uh, can you give us a little background of how the Lord has led you from that point to the point that we're here right now, where you're making the decision that you're going to seal your commitment in baptism? Quite frankly, um, when I, tried, when I um, tried out this church, you know, not only was there the young people, but a better message mm. that I quite frankly never got and was quite confused by the previous church I attended. Mm. And I know that hurts my, and I know that offends my parents because I know they still like to go to the church that I no longer go to. Mm. And um, since my uh, accident, when, since my accident, I've made a decision that I should try to recommit my life even if it's going to be hard because, I mean, either way, I probably wouldn't have died in the accident, but, you know, so I you think, I think that, when the doctors told me, they were, they were a little surprised that, you know, I survived it with only just some minor back pain on my upper uh, right shoulder. And, you know, only had to take ibuprofen. I just decided, that, you know, I need to recommit my life. And then upon going to Camp Asable and then, you know, given the opportunity to uh, walk up and, and to recommit my life to Lord even rebaptize. I'm like, Amen. well, why not? Maybe Amen. I'll have a better understanding uh, that I uh, didn't have back when I was baptized for the first time at uh, 14 years old. Mm -hmm. Amen. And so uh, you have you came out from that accident unscathed. That's a miracle in itself. Like no serious injuries as a result of that. The Lord definitely had His hand over you during that time, and that's when you started to sense this need to recommit yourself to the Lord. Absolutely, awesome. because I've realized that I just cannot take the Lord's kindness for granted. I need to give back to him in return in some way. Mm. Amen, amen. And you're going to do that today by offering yourself up to him as a living sacrifice, and that's going to be wonderful. And so I want to take uh, time to recognize the family. I know that you have some family here with us. And so can we have the members, friends, and family to stand at this time so that we can know who you are? Welcome. Thank you for joining us. 
this is a very special day, and thank you for allowing Steve to be a part of our church family as well, and we appreciate you. And I know that uh, Steve Cousins Sr. Is, is also a chaplain, uh, and he's also been a pastor, is that correct, in the, in the past? And so we're so happy that you're here to join us for this event and, and to worship with us today. So thank you for coming. He's an amazing public speaker. Amen. Amen. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to go through those vows. And um, I'm going to read each vow, Steve. And if you're in agreement with it, you just simply say, I do. Okay? Sounds simple enough, right? <laughs> All right. So here we go. I believe there is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a unity of three co-eternal persons. I do. I accept the death of Jesus Christ on Calvary as the atoning sacrifice for my sins and believe that by God's grace through faith in his shed blood, I am saved from sin and its penalty. I do. I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and personal Savior and believe that God in Christ has forgiven my sins and given me a new heart, and I renounce the sinful ways of the world. I do. I accept by faith the righteousness of Christ, my intercessor in the heavenly sanctuary, and I accept his promise of transforming grace and power to live a loving, Christ-centered life in my home and before the world. I do. I believe that the Bible is God's inspired word, the only rule of faith and practice for the Christian. I covenant to spend time regularly in prayer and Bible study. I do. I accept the Ten Commandments as a transcript of the character of God and a revelation of his will. It is my purpose by the power of the indwelling Christ to keep this law, including the fourth commandment, which requires the observance of the seventh day of the week as a Sabbath of the Lord and a memorial of creation. I do. I look forward to the soon coming of Jesus and the blessed hope when this mortal shall put on immortality. As I prepare to meet the Lord, I will witness to his loving salvation by using my talents in personal soul winning endeavor to help others be ready for his glorious appearing. I do. I accept the biblical teaching of spiritual gifts and believe that the gift of prophecy is one of the identifying marks of the remnant church. I do. I believe in church organization. It is my purpose to worship God and to support the church through my tithes and offerings and by my personal effort and influence. I do. I believe that my body is a temple of the Holy Spirit and I will honor God by caring for it, avoiding the use of that which is harmful and abstaining from all unclean foods, from the use, manufacture, or sale of alcoholic beverages, from the use, manufacture, or sale of tobacco in any of its forms for human consumption and for the misuse of or trafficking in narcotics or other drugs. I do. I know and understand the fundamental Bible principle as taught by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I purpose by the grace of God to fulfill his will by ordering my life in harmony with these principles. I do. And the last... Well, actually, second to last, I'm sorry. I accept the New Testament teaching of baptism by immersion and desire to be so baptized as a public expression of faith in Christ and his forgiveness of my sins. I do. Okay. I accept and believe that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the remnant church of Bible prophecy and that the people of every nation, race, and language are invited and accepted into its fellowship. I desire to be a member of this local congregation of the worldwide Seventh-day Adventist Church. I do. Amen. Amen. And now I'd like to uh, ask the church here that's uh, representing uh, today, is there a motion to accept Steve Cousins uh, as a member of the Adventist, Ann Arbor Adventist Church subject to baptism? There's a motion. Is there a second? Okay, all those in favor? Okay, very good. Thank you. So, Steve, we are so glad to have you as a part of our church family. And uh, we're going to uh, go ahead and seal this decision in the baptistry, in the waters of baptism. So, thank you.
quick hop. Thanks for these songs. We give you thanks for the people that are committing their lives to you, Lord. We thank you because you are an awesome God, an amazing God that cares for us and loves us. And thank you for your kind warnings and protection towards us. We pray that for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit in this church because they are the leaders. And Lord, we pray that you please continue guiding us throughout the rest of this service. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Please stand. We will sing him number 12. So we'll do the offering call while they're getting ready in the back. Um, so you're actually getting a two for today. Uh, not only we're doing the offering call, I'm also doing a little report on the um, churches or the Michigan Conference's annual business meeting that happened last weekend. Um, the basic takeaways are that our conference is is growing, albeit slowly but steadily. Um, our tithe is growing. Um, we the the big projects that this conference has had over the last couple of years, including the Eagle Lodge up at Camp Asabel and the uh, new conference building are going well. The financing has been essentially secured for the Eagle Lodge due to some um, generosity from, from several high-level donors, which is amazing. Um, the other kind of big takeaway, um, as the transition from Elder Gallimore to Elder Mitchup as, as the conference leadership, um, the, there's, I think, been an increase in, you know, as, as finances have tightened, at the, at the conference level, and that's true kind of around the country and around the division. Um, and I know Elder Mitchiff, Elder Ringstaff, and, and Treasurer Bernard are uh, committed to, to increase fiscal responsibility. That isn't a knock on, on the, those who went before, but it's just adapting to a new age. And, and one of the things that they're doing is, is trying to make sure that projects don't have cost overruns since they're altering their bid process which is technical, but still, it's interesting. And I think that kind of after all that, um, I think that we can say that our conference leadership are, are godly men who are trying to do their best to facilitate the spreading of the gospel in Michigan. So on that note, um, our offering today is for MAP, Michigan Advanced Partners. For those of you who don't know, that uh, is, a, is a 
provides funding for um, evangelism, uh, our schools, the campground at Camp Meeting and uh, Camp Asabo, and for a variety of local church projects. Um, so far in 2019, we've, Michigan has raised $667,000 to support that. That means we've raised $220,000 for just evangelism, $100,000 for our academies, um, and $120,000 for tuition assistance to our schools. Um, amen? <laughs> All right. Um, MAP is in, it's encouraged to be 1% of, of your income or 10% or of tithe. Um, and that may seem like a lot, but the, 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 the work this money does is, is amazing. Um, in addition to all those big things, it's funded projects across the state. You know, um, this year we have helped fund the roof at PMC in Berrien Springs, um, TV, evangelism TV programming through Detroit Northwest. Um, they've gotten rid of the orange carpet at the Mount Pleasant Church. Um, we put a furnace in Iron River, and we're helping to make that church alive again. And, and uh, the church at Kalamazoo Countryside, we're helping to put their church in working order because it was uh, damaged by an earthquake several years ago, and they still haven't recovered. Um, at, you know, every, every quarterly meeting of the lay advisory committee that I'm at, we take money and stretch it further than you think it'd go. Um, MAP keeps Michigan sisterhood of churches in condition and enables them to spread Jesus. Um, I think that's a fantastic thing, and so I encourage you to be faithful and generous in your giving today. Um, the deaconesses are going to collect the offering. Thanks.
please bow your heads with me. <clears throat> Sorry. Dear God, um, you are a being of infinite power, and yet you care about each one of us and each person in our, our city and our state and our world. Um, you took a basket of loaves and fishes and turned it into an infinite, almost infinite amount. Do the same thing with our, our offerings today. Um, the work spreading the gospel in Michigan is important. Um, and, and we're giving in faith that you're going to take that and multiply it and bless that. Do that. Amen. Before children's story, now we're going to allow time for the baptism. No kids here, okay? Sense. It is like a children's story <laughs> because uh, we are now having a child of God that's going to commit his life in the waters of baptism. So we don't want to forget that. <laughs> but uh, Steve, uh, as we've been, as I've been recollecting about our time together, we've been studying the Bible together, and Elder Scott has also been instrumental in being a part of that. And and already you've been experiencing during our time in the Word these truths that you've always known growing up, but now you have a new discovery, a new revelation. You're like, wow, I, I heard you say many times, wow, this is stuff that I thought I knew, but now I'm learning them again for the first time, and you were just in awe of all that you were learning. And that was pretty amazing to see you go through that journey of rediscovery again. And also I believe that uh, you and Elder Scott are going through the Discipleship Handbook even now, and so that's wonderful. And so uh, thank you, Elder Scott, for, for taking him under your wing and mentoring him. And uh, we really want to uh, give God the gl glory and the honor today. And I believe that based on your testimony and what you've gone through, God has truly led you to this point. And so we, we know that this is a very special day, a special decision that you're making. And I also want everyone who is in the congregation today, if there's anyone that is contemplating the decision for baptism and you haven't made that decision, I want you to follow the example of this young man right here who's saying that there's nothing, there's no reason to delay, nothing holding you back from making this decision for Christ. And so praise the Lord for, for doing that and uh, we're inspired by your example and may the Lord use you in a very powerful way. So. Brother Steve, I know that it's because your love for Jesus and your willingness to recommit your life to him and to follow in his way from this moment on. It's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.
Happy Sabbath, children. Today I got an exciting story. In fact, so exciting, I can wait to tell you all about it. So this is actually the story of a missionary to the South Pacific Islands to the cannibals. So today we're going to use the word spring. You say the word spring? Yeah. So spring is a small stream of water that flows naturally from the earth. The uh, verse that goes with the story is Isaiah 35, 7, and the scorched land will become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. And you can find springs, uh, the word springs 41 times in the Bible. So where did this story take place? Well, we're going to more obey the map. Can I hold that sign? Okay. So um, this, this story takes place in the 1860s. It's missionary John Patton from Scotland, a contemporary of uh, David uh, Livingstone, which was another missionary to Africa. And his co went to the uh, South Pacific Islands. So where are the South Pacific Islands? So we got Michigan here. So we fly west on the North Pacific, keeps heading north, and then keep south past the equator, which is that imaginary line that divides the, the planet, well, the, the Earth, uh, north from south. And we get to the east part of uh, Australia, kind of northeast. And there is the island of, uh, right now it's called Vanuatu. It was in Hebrides when he first left. So uh, you say Vanuatu. Well, Vanuatu is actually made of 80 islands. 65 of them are, I are inhabited now. And so he went to the island of Aniwa. The island of Aniwa is a very tiny island, seven miles long by two miles width. Not a very uh, large island. It's kind of uh, south here. And uh, he had previously been at the island of Tana for about three years, and he received a lot of opposition from the cannibals. So he made it to the island of Aniwa, and uh, he realized there wasn't a lot of fresh water. They really actually don't really have much, they don't have rivers, they don't have creeks or ponds or wells or lakes. The rain will come very quickly and gets absorbed by the soil and the, and the ground. And so there was only one hole for fresh water for people to drink, and it was in the land of the witch doctor. So he was like, he wasn't gonna let them have uh, water for free. He has whatever price he wanted. You're thirsty, you're going to pay for it with me. And so missionary Patton has started helping with, uh, with the sick people, but then realized we need to get free water. This guy is taking advantage of his own people. So he said, Chief Namake, we need to build a well. We need to get fresh water from the ground. But remember, they never seen any wells or creeks or rivers. So the chief is kind of confused. Rain from the ground? How are you going to do that? So well, we're gonna, you know, get our shovel and dig a hole, and I need help. And the natives are laughing. Oh, digging is for women, they said. They're pretty lazy in that island back then. The men, all they did was fight each other and eat their enemies. The women had to do all the work and had to do all the shoveling and all the, uh, the wood picking. So he said, um, but that's, that's what we need to do. So we're gonna dig a hole. We're gonna get a, a fresh water from the ground and you can have as much fresh water as you want anytime, fill your buckets anytime, it's going to be free. So I said, okay. So I said, I need help. And the one lady said, well, you give me one of those metal fish hooks, I'll help. So he said, well, for every day of work, a man gets a metal fish hook. And so some men said, okay, we'll start digging. So there comes, you know, they start digging and digging, and it's the, like half day. So uh, a missionary pattern is taking a break. And then he remembers what happened at the previous island. Uh, the, uh, he, there were at least about 40 attempts on his life alone on, on the uh, island of Tana. He remembers one time a cannibal came running at him. And so what he did is he hugged the, the, the cannibal real tight and made him drop his weapon. And so he was you know, saved that way. Another time a cannibal came and pointed a musket at his heart. And so uh, what the missionary did is he quickly shoved the barrel up and the uh, bullet went up in the air and spared his life. So this man had a lot of close calls with the cannibals. But this time I said the, the reception was better, but then as he's looking at the work, uh-oh, the soil starts caving in uh, on the man that's digging. And now his feet are all full of uh, soil and, and, and so the witch doctor, see, you are gonna, getting the uh, gods of the earth angry and everybody's gonna die. And so they quickly get over the well. 
And she's like, oh no, he's like, I'm gonna have to dig it by myself. Now let me pass this real quick because I'm talking. This is a, it's a little piece of coral. Coral is a big part of what makes the South Pacific Islands and it's very hard to get out of it, right? So this is part of the work he had to dig through. He had to dig through coral. Some coral can be colorful, some coral can be uh, very slender or and thin, but this is pretty tough coral. So there he goes, start digging. Day one, no water. There comes day two, all by himself. His hands are getting blistered. And he's digging and digging. The natives are saying, please, missionary pattern, stop. If you fell through the hole, the sharks are gonna eat you. He said, no, <laughs> we need to get fresh water. And the end of day two, and there is no water. And comes day three, and still no water. Oh, it's the end of day three. And he notices there is moisture on the coral and the soil. So he's like, okay, maybe we'll get some water by tomorrow. So it's day four, he comes with the shovel, and whoa, this spring of water just gushes up. And so he grabs his cup all excited. Oh, it's fresh water. He yells, water, uh, everybody, we got water. And so the children and the men and the women come running to check this water. So the cups start being passed, and so he gets a cup to the chief. Chief Namake, you go first. Oh, the chief is suspicious. Hmm, it looks like rainwater. Hmm, it kind of drips like rainwater. Hmm. He puts his little finger and dips. Drips like rainwater. He takes a sip. Wow, it's rain. It is rainwater. And so the cup is being passed, and everybody's enjoying their fresh water finally for free. So he said, okay, hear me out, my people. He said, <laughs> he said, uh, only the true God could bring fresh water, rainwater from the ground. And so from now on, we're going to burn all our idols from our home. And from now on, we're going to listen to Missionary Patton, the story of God and his son, Jesus. And Missionary Patton is so thankful. Oh, Lord, finally. So that is how the gospel entered the island of Aniwa. And the chief kept his promise. He became Christian, and he shared the, the gospel till he died. Now it gets even better. Uh, many men tried to dig wells on the island of Aniwa. All those wells were all salty water. None of them got fresh water. So that was an extra miracle that God did for rewarding the faith of uh, John Paul. Stout, and he said, um, I thank you that it's Sabbath. Um, thank you for this day. I thank you that you died on the cross for our sins. I pray for the sick and the ill and the homeless. Pray and be with us. Amen. Thank you, Auntie Anna, for the children's story. We have a few minutes for a congregational prayer, and so I want to take a, a few prayer requests um, or praises. So I don't know if any, anyone that would like to share, please go ahead. Was a recently was recently baptized, and my wife and I were doing a discipleship class, and we got very close to knowing Patrick. So he, he's very dear in our hearts. So we definitely will pray for him as a church, and also individually, me and my wife are praying for him. Anyone else? And this. We received an email from from Ken saying that Karen Fan's granddaughter, Lavani, I, I believe she's in Mexico, and right now she's in an induced coma, and she's a very young lady, she's almost zero. 
same situation with my wife. Um, we don't know the full details, but I just want to point that out. I want to pray for that. What about one more? Anyone else would like to share? Yes, Amana. Let us see you on time. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you because we know that you are a God that listens and an almighty, an almighty God. We thank you for allowing us to come to church. We thank you because we are able to rest in this day and for this week that has been chaotic for many of us. Lord, we want to lift up to you Patrick Rose. He's very dear. He's part of our church. He's part of our family. And he underwent surgery and the latest news that he's recovering well. Um, but the recovery is, is going slow. So Lord, we pray that you please put on your Holy Spirit to comfort over his life. And we pray that we may soon come to our church and we may uh, see him and, may, and we may say, that it, it's a miracle that he's, that he's still alive and he's still um, walking. And Lord, we also want to pray for Lavani, uh, Brian Crane's granddaughter. Um, we don't know the full details of, of, of what, what happened, but we pray that you please bring comfort to all family, family members. I pray that you please be with the doctors. I pray and the decisions that they're going to make. Um, I pray that you please heal her. I pray that you please bring her back, and I pray that you please take control of her life, because we know that you listen. We want to thank you, because we see your best interest for us to be well, and Lord, we we ask for your guidance. Please continue guiding us as we continue with our service. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. <laughs> Good morning. Our scripture this morning is found in Luke chapter 6, verse 27 and 28. And it says, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use, spitefully use you. May the Lord add his blessing. And we now have special music by the McGenzie family. Sing the song for in the in the land of hundred days.
morning. Happy Sabbath, everyone. You can hear me well in the back? All right. That was a beautiful song. Thank you for that song. And congratulations, Steve, on your baptism. Welcome to the family. Um, when we left Ann Arbor two years ago, um, we didn't know that God was going to bring us back to Ann Arbor this, this soon. And we're so glad he did because we feel absolutely at home in this church. Uh, and uh, the love and the support uh, that we receive as a family is just amazing. And I really hope and pray that everyone in this sanctuary feels the same way. Um, let's start with a word of prayer before we begin. Our gracious, loving Father in heaven, thank you so much for this beautiful Sabbath morning. God, as we meditate on your word for the next few minutes, we pray that your spirit will dwell among us and that you would open our eyes to things that we can't see ourselves. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. <clears throat> For uh, those of you who peeked at the bulletin or looked at the whiteboard outside, you may have a clue about what we're going to talk about today. But for others who haven't, or those of you who are scrambling to look at bulletin, the, the title of my sermon is, Someone Hates My Gut, Now What? Now I promise you, today's sermon is not going to be a therapy session or a self-help speech on how to deal with people who don't like us. But we are going to learn some important lessons about how to deal with difficult people from a very unlikely Bible character to teach us on the subject. A story is told about a reporter who was interviewing an old man who was celebrating his 100th birthday. The reporter asked the old man, so what are you most proud of? Well, said the old man, I don't have a single enemy in the world. The reporter said, what a beautiful thought. That's very inspirational. Yep, said the old man, I have outlived every last one of them. <laughs> the world is full of people. And just that thought is carried to the introverts among us. And to add to that, Every single one has a different personality. And that comes with different thoughts, different words, different actions, and we end up clashing with some of them. Interestingly, the people we clash with are not the strangers on the street. Most of the time, it's actually our immediate family, our extended family, our co-workers, friends, friends of friends, not to mention fellow church members. I'm not talking about, oh, I don't like what he said during Sabbath school today. Or I don't know if I like what she's wearing to church today. I'm talking about something much deeper, gut-wrenching hatred. Not too long ago, I used to think that I didn't have anyone that hated me that much. But I'm pretty sure now I have a few people that, that hate me, hate my guts for things I've said or things I've done to them in the past. Take a moment and think about one person in your life that might hate your guts. Or one person you hate at a much more deep personal level. Well, if you can think of one person, this sermon is definitely for you. But if you can't, praise God. But you can tuck this message away for posterity because it might happen to you in the future. But if you're absolutely co convinced that you won't have an enemy in your life, you can probably head to the gym and have start, start on the lunch a little early. We'll come join you. I'm just kidding. I think you should still stay. The Bible character who is going to teach us about how to deal with difficult people today is King David. 
of all people. Now I know some of us have a very a soft image of King David from our kindergarten times, you know, those beautiful books, the cute boy with the sling. King David was anything but a soft character. Uh, he is actually a central figure in the history of Israel. He was called a man after God's own heart, as you all know. He was a man of war, a very good one. In fact, he rarely lost a war. He surrounded himself with mighty men of valor, or in other words, scary-looking people. And the Messiah would then later on be called the son of David. Overall, bottom line, he is a hero of Israel. Still is. But he had his ups and downs, didn't he, in his life? Especially that incident with Bathsheba. That was a low. And, and the historians, if, if you consider Bible a history book, uh, it would have excluded that story, you know. That's a little embarrassing to your hero. But the Bible includes it. And that's one of the proofs that the Bible is true because it doesn't exclude those embarrassing stories. And we're going to talk about a story today that makes King David look, look a little less strong, weak. But I, I believe that God has a strong message for us through that story this word. All right. So, let's turn our Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 15. I'm going to project most of the verses here on the screen as well. Before we jump into the core text, let's set up the context of the story a little bit. David is getting old. He had many wives and concubines, as we all know, and through them had many sons and daughters. As David is getting older, one of the central questions in the mind, minds of his children are who is going to succeed one of the greatest kings of Israel. And this is where Absalom, one of the sons of David, shines as a mighty warrior and a politician. He was tall and handsome too. That always helped. So he would sit at the city gate and judge people. Basically thereby impressing the elders in the community uh, of his credentials as a ruler. And at one point he convinces enough leaders in the community that they started preferring Absalom as their king over the old and shriveled King David in the palace. And this is when David took off, running, this old man, from his palace, fearing his own son. Also, he didn't want to fight his own son and hurt him in the process either. So here he is. It's a shameful day for the house of David. Very shameful. 2 Samuel 15, 30. But David went up the ascent of the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went, barefoot and with his head covered. And all the people who were with him covered their heads, and they went up weeping as they went. Just imagine this. The king, walking barefoot, weeping, with something covering his head. Passing through town after town, as his subjects basically staring at the king in his most undignified state. Now let's read 2 Samuel chapter 16, verse 5. When King David came to Behurim, there came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera. And as he came, he cursed continually. And he threw stones at David and at all the servants of King David and all the people and all the mighty men who were on his right hand and on his left. And Shimei said as he cursed, Get out, get out, ye man of blood, you worthless man. 
Not only did David have to endure the embarrassment leaving the palace and his throne, but he now has to deal with this man who's cursing at him as he's passing through his town. Who is this man? All we know is that he is he belongs to the house of Saul. Why is he so bitter at King David? The next verse answers it. Verse 8. The Lord has avenged on you all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose place you have reigned. And the Lord has given the kingdom into the hand of your son Absalom. See, your evil is on you, for you are a man of blood. There you go. That's why he's so bitter at David. He thinks David took the place of Saul. Now imagine this. Saul was the first king of Israel. And the second king of Israel should have been Prince Jonathan, or one of the sons of Saul. And if one of them had ascended to the throne, this guy Shimei would have had a privileged life. And now he doesn't. He thinks David dethroned Saul. And that's why he's so mad. Now let's think about this from Shimei's perspective for a minute. He truly believed that David actually threw out the, the house of Saul and destroyed it before he came, became king of Israel. He, he didn't know that Saul lost his throne because of his own disobedience and that God had chosen David even when he was a child to become the next king. You see, history books were not written then. He sincerely cursed David for what he had done to Saul. Now, let's be honest here for a minute. As humans, we, we become a little bit happy when our enemies are having a bad day. Right? That's what's happening here with Shimei and David. And what's more dangerous is, as men and women of faith, we take it a, a notch higher. We think God is bringing a punishment upon our enemies. You know, when our enemies are having a little bad health, or they have a little financial downfall, or their kids are misbehaving, we immediately think God had brought the punishment upon them on our behalf for what they have done for us. The problem is, we rarely know the big picture. Here, Shimei thought he was right, you know, in cursing David for what he did to the house of Saul. But we know he was not. Unfortunately, a lot of times we act like Shimei, don't we? In Proverbs chapter 24, verse 17, it says, Do not rejoice when your enemy falls. And let not your heart be glad when he stumbles. Lest the Lord see it and be displeased. The next time when you're tempted to rejoice over the downfall of your enemy, think of Shimei. Lesson number one. Do not rejoice over the downfall of your enemy or think that, the, that God had brought that punishment upon them on your behalf because we do not know the full story. Remember, let's, let's move on. Remember, David is not alone here. He may have left his throne and his palace, but he's got all the mighty men of valor and his army traveling with him. You know, the scary looking people are with him. So in verse 9, then Abishai, the son of Zuriah, said to the king, why should this dead dog curse my lord, lord the king? Let me go over and take off his head, and he would have. That was a different time. That would have happened. The, this is where David makes two beautiful statements that touch my heart. Are you with me? Verse 10. He says, if he is cursing because the Lord has said to him, Curse David. Who then shall say, Why have you done so? 
You see what he did there? He completely removed Shimei out of the picture. He is saying, if God wants to curse me, let him curse me. He removed, he sees Shimei as merely a human agent of that curse. The human being is not the one that's cursing. If you're going to receive a curse, it's going to be from God. And Shimei or any other human being in your life is merely an agent. The human being has no faith, no power over the fate of David. For believers, there is no blessing, there is no curse, there is no luck or fortune apart from God. In India, blessings and curses are a huge deal. If, uh, you, if somebody is suffering because of what you may have said or done, they could curse you, and it's believed that that curse would fall upon you or your family in some kind of a universal justice or karma kind of way. And I noticed some similar sentiments in Central America and Africa when I've traveled through those countries. But for some reason, uh, in America, the whole concept of curses is not emphasized as much. But you know what is emphasized? Luck and misfortune. So I am in a business uh, of uh, unpredictable events. I'm in trauma surgery. And your day could be boring, or you could be deep in somebody's abdomen or chest all day after a gunshot wound or something. So your day can be easy or hard. If somebody in my team at the end of a day says, you know, that was a, a quiet day. You know what everybody does? Everybody immediately finds a piece of wood and knocks on the wood. <laughs> Have you done that? Have you knocked on wood at least once in the last month? No? No? Okay. I always say I don't believe in that stuff. <laughs> and I, I went and did a little bit of research. Where is this knocking on wood coming from? And most sources led me to the theory that um, it's an ancient pagan practice where you're knocking on wood. It's supposed to chase away evil spirits from listening to your fortunes and in turn preventing them from reversing those fortunes. Uh, but the question is not whether there is blessings and curses. The Bible is full of references about blessings and curses. The question is, can another human being implement a blessing or a curse or a luck or a misfortune upon us? I strongly believe that the answer is no. You need a supernatural force to enforce such blessing and curses. That's what the Bible says. And, and in this, I strongly believe that the God we worship alone has the power to bless us or curse us. The world, the, the, the words that comes out of an enemy's mouth means absolutely nothing unless those words are meant for you from God. Now, if we can come to a place in our faith where we, we take every curse that comes from a human being as a possible curse from God, or if we can take every luck and fortunes as blessings from God, we won't be afraid of our future. And here's lesson number two. There is no blessing or curse that comes upon a believer without the permission of God, even if it means it came out of the mouth of our enemy. Right, let's move on. Verse 12. It may be that the Lord will look on the wrong done to me 
and that the Lord will repay me with good for his person today. And this is the second beautiful thing David says in the story. He's presenting an alternate scenario. He believes that if the curses were not meant for him, God will convert those curses into blessings. Did, did David say something profoundly new? No. This is actually described in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, we know the story of Balaam and how he comes and curses the people of Israel. But the Lord your God would not listen to Balaam. Instead, the Lord your God turned the curse into a blessing for you. Because the Lord your God loved you. And this is a sermon for another day. But here's lesson number three. If the curses were not meant for you, if some human being in your life is cursing at you or, or wishing you misfortune, and if it's not meant for you from God, God can turn them into blessings for you. Well, the story doesn't end here. David moves on that day. Doesn't do anything to Shimei. And we all know that David becomes king again in Jerusalem after the death of his son Absalom. And when David is in his deathbed, he's talking to his son Solomon who would take his throne. Brings Shimei up in that conversation. He didn't forget that day. But, but he doesn't say go and kill him. But Shimei didn't just go scot-free. You know, he, he had some consequences to deal with for what he did to David that day. Uh, in fact, if you read that story, Shimei is asked to move into Jerusalem, which is not a you know, bad place, capital city. Why not? Right? But uh, his mandate was to never leave Jerusalem. And uh, if you read the story, he leaves Jerusalem for a silly reason and, and ends up getting killed by King Solomon. But let's recap the three lessons we learned from David in this story. Number one, do not rejoice over the misfortunes of your enemies or think that God has brought a punishment upon them on your behalf because we rarely know the full story. Lesson number two, every blessing, every curse, every luck and fortune or misfortune comes to a believer from God. So do not curse your enemies, and if they do curse you, it will not affect you unless God intends that for you. Number three. God can turn an unjust curse into a blessing. So you can think about all the people or one or two persons who have actually hurt you. The words they may have spoken or the actions they may have done against you. None of that happened to you without God's permission. And if it, if it was not meant for you, he is turning that into a blessing. Now, I'm really tempted to sit down right now. This would be a great time to wrap up this session. But it won't be fair to you all if I sat down right now. Because I did not answer the question I raised in the title of my sermon. Someone hates my guts. Now what? King David can give you some pointers here and there. It's very unlikely by the character to give us advice on that, being a man of war. But he did. And the, we learned a few lessons. But he, he can't tell us how ultimately we should deal with our enemies. The answer to the question of someone hates my guts, now what? Is a Big, big, big 
bitter pill to swallow. I'm sorry. Jesus comes along and raises the bar so high on the subject. And he tells us what to do with our enemies. The ultimate way to deal with our enemies are the people who don't like us. Let's turn our Bibles to Luke chapter 6, verses 27 and 28. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. I told you. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. And pray for those who abuse you. This is a step higher than what King David taught us. And that's an understatement. This radically changes how we're supposed to deal with our enemies. Someone hates my guts. Now what? Jesus would say, now love them. Now do good to them. Bless them. And pray for them. I told you, it's a big, big, bitter pill to swallow. Now, you may be tempted to think that this is a biblical suggestion. I'm afraid it's a Christian mandate. You see, Jesus didn't just say it. He lived it. You remember when he was beaten, spit on, dragged, given a cross, and was eventually crucified? You know what he said from the cross? Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. I know this goes against the very essence of our sinful human nature. We live in an age of mass shootings. And out of these horrific stories emerge some of the most authentic Christianity. We all remember Sandy Hook shooting in 2012, where 26 people were gunned down, most of them children. Hours after the shooting, Robbie Parker, the father of a six-year-old girl who was killed that day, stood in front of cameras and said these words. We'd like to offer our deepest condolences to all the families who are directly affected by this shooting. It's a horrific tragedy, and we want everybody to know that our hearts and our prayers go out to them. This includes the family of the shooter. And I can't imagine how hard this experience must be for you. And I want you to know that our family and our love and our support goes out to you as well. In 2015, a young white man sat uh, sat through an evening Bible study in a historic black church in Charleston, South Carolina. And in the middle of the Bible study, he opened fire and killed nine people. Days after this incident, the daughter of one of the victims said these words to the victim, or to to the perpetrator. You took something very precious away from me, and I will never talk to her ever again. I will never be able to hold her again, but I forgive you. I really hope and pray that none of us here are ever in that situation. But these words capture the very essence of true Christianity. Let me read it one more time before I sit down. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you.
Thank you, Dr. Paul Sear, for that message. Uh, before we sing our closing hymn, I'd like to invite uh, Steve Cousins to come up here one, for one last time. And Steve, we want to leave some parting gifts to you uh, to start you in your new journey with Christ. And I believe that we also have a book there also that is about ready to be given as well. Yes. But um, thank you for that message. That was a very uh, timely message things that we need to understand and lessons that we can learn um, as we are followers of Christ. And so uh, here it comes. Perfect. Thank you, Elder Scott. So Steve, this is just a, a small token of what we as a church would like to offer you. Along with your baptismal certificate. So welcome to the family and may God bless you from here on out. And thank you. Let's all stand as we sing our closing hymn. <laughs> Father in heaven, we don't deserve the forgiveness that you have extended upon us day after day. And God, we struggle to forgive others as well. But as you taught us today, we pray that you would give us the strength to love, to forgive, to bless, and to pray for those very people that have done the opposite for us. As we leave the, the comforts of this sanctuary and go out into a world that is ready to hurt us, we need your protection, God, to begin with. And we trust that anything that happens to us happens to us with your permission. Bless the week ahead. And may this week be something that will bring us closer to you most of all. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.